in my opinion, as I got to know Mosley better as a friend and colleague, I consider he's probably the greatest Englishman of, of our time. Definitely the greatest Englishman of our time. Probably the greatest Englishman of all time. A really astonishing man. Dan Harmston, a market porter, recalling one of the most controversial men of modern Britain, mentioned the name of Sir Oswald Mosley even now, half a century after his fascist movement was eclipsed by the outbreak of war, and almost a decade after his death, and it still arouses strong emotions. The force of his oratory, the power of his intellect are almost universally acknowledged, but Mosley is despised for his disdain for parliamentary democracy, his contempt for Britain's Jews, and his off-stated desire to maintain peace with Hitler and Mussolini at almost any cost. When we have power, there will be no war, because we shall make peace with Germany and Italy in a new union of the great nations of Europe. Mosley was born into a landed family, served in the First World War, and immediately after entered Parliament as a Conservative. Haunted by the feeling that the war generation had been betrayed, he changed allegiance to the Labour Party and became one of its rising stars. But his widow, Lady Mosley, speaking from her home outside Paris, says he was dismayed by the failure of all the conventional parties to come to grips with the problem of mass unemployment. He was 13 years or something in Parliament, and uh, he really did feel it was simply a talking shop. They did nothing. So Mosley broke away and formed the new party. But that came to grief in the 1931 election. Geoffrey Hamm, later Mosley's private secretary, recalls the next fateful step. Mosley then took the very controversial step of saying we don't need just a new party, uh, but something entirely above parties, a, a, a movement and a fascist movement. And fascism was not a discredited word then as it became later, it just became a term of abuse. He was now forever exiled from the mainstream of politics. But Lady Mosley, at one time a close acquaintance of Hitler, who attended the Mosley's wedding celebrations, insists that her husband at least had the merit of consistency. He was somebody who stood all through his political career for rearmament, first of all as a Tory party, then in the Labour Party, and then as a, a fascist. But uh, he did not think we should intervene in the continent in uh, other people's quarrels. His motto was, mind Britain's business. See over all the streets the fascist banners waving. Mosley embarked on the task of building a mass fascist movement, intensely patriotic, almost military in discipline. Recruits wore the fascist black shirt until political uniforms were banned by law. Parliament was to be swept away and the economy revived by state intervention and trade protectionism. In the bleak interwar years, it seemed to offer hope. Bill Wood remembers why he was attracted to fascism. Well, partly because of the hopelessness of the situation when you were on the dole at 17 bob a week and nobody seemed to know or want to know anything about you and uh, your future outlook was practically hopeless. I happened to uh, be in Leeds uh, one time when Mosley had a meeting in Leeds Town Hall and it was something so different from the respectable Conservatives or the Socialist Red right Front. But the one enduring fascist stronghold was in East London, where Sid Bailey was among Mosley's followers. You've got to remember that the East End of London was a great working class area, and therefore these were the people who were suffering most in the Depression. So they point about they were looking for alternatives. They were desperate. They were been betrayed, they'd been let down by the Labour Party, and they were men, ex-servicemen from the First World War, who promised the land fit for the heroes to live in, and when they come back, they came back to depression, misery, queues, long unemployment queues, and everything. So what are they going to turn to? The patriotism, the parades, the uniform, all had their appeal, but the main attraction of British fascism was Mosley himself. He combined a certain aristocratic aloofness with speeches which always came to a rousing crescendo. In the lives of great nations, comes the moment of decision, comes the moment of destiny. 
and this nation again and again in the great hours of its fate has fortified convention and has decided to follow men and movements who say we go forward to action let who dare follow us in this hour. I think the main thing that attracted you was Mosley himself because he was six foot four and because he was a fencing champion too of Britain and he had that sort of agile figure and his manner of speech was almost like uh, machine gunning sometimes with facts and figures where they used to come out but it was certainly something different. The British Union of Fascists, like similar movements on the continent, was very much a one-man show. Geoffrey Hamm describes Mosley as tall, dark and handsome and occasionally a little overbearing. I met him once off a train in, in Manchester and he stepped into the first taxi that, that he saw and a railway policeman said to him, you can't do that, sir, there's a long queue. And he said, queue, queue, too much of that dumb nonsense in this country and had driven off before the, <laughs> the policeman could think of any answer to it. At first, Mosley got support from one of the best-selling newspapers, the Daily Mail. It once ran an article headlined, Hurrah for the Black Shirts. But fascist thuggery against political opponents and particularly the savage beatings sometimes meted out to communists who tried to disrupt black shirt meetings, antagonised Mosley's more influential supporters. And that, it seems, was what prompted him to turn to a more rabble-rousing, anti-Jewish form of fascism. But Lady Mosley says her husband was not anti-Semitic. Actually, the boot was on the other foot. Uh, he was not an anti-Semite. He wasn't interested in the subject ever. But you see, the Jews attacked him. The reason was they were having a very bad time in Germany. And they saw similarities between our movement and National Socialism. And in the East End of London, they're not very much loved, the Jews. And a great many people joined the movement down there in the hopes, I suppose, that most of as they were so hostile to him, would, would be hostile to them. Well, he said, they attack us non-stop. Now I'm going to attack them. That doesn't quite square with Bill Wood's recollection of the anti-Jewish rhymes some of his fellow fascists chanted as they marched through the streets. It had an almost sinister effect of going down the hedgerow with a long line of column. The yids, the yids, we're going to get rid of the yids. We're going to get rid, we're going to get rid, we're going to get rid of the alien yids. Tramp, 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 the yids. Anti-Jewish slogans, anti-Jewish marches, inevitably led to fights, especially when the fascists tried to march through the largely Jewish districts of East London. The Mosleyites, the Black Church, were intent that they were going to march in demonstration through the East End. And the opposition, which was largely communist-inspired, they were intent that Mosley would not walk through the East End. Tom Wilson was then a police constable in London. He was on duty at the most notorious of these clashes, what has gone down in history as the Battle of Cable Street in October 1936. It looked to me that we were getting it from everybody, both sides, and everything was being thrown at us. Stones, railing tops, bricks, owl bricks, bottles, tin cans, the lot. By now, the war clouds were gathering over Europe. Britain's fascists were becoming more closely identified in the public mind with Hitler in Germany. Mosley was asked, late in his life, what he would have done if he'd ever become Britain's leader to avert the Second World War. Well, I think that one would obviously have seen uh, much more of Hitler than I ever did see of him, and say, now, you've got every position you want except one, question of the Polish corridor. Why not play it, in fact, you should play it politically. Say to the English, how would you like Yorkshire and Lancashire divided by a corridor with foreign troops in between? This cannot last. Now help me be fair about it and play it, in fact, politically as he could have played it. But all that jumping up around and threatening and waving flags and threatening other people aroused all the fighting instincts in our people and was a mad act of folly, making war absolutely necessary. Not necessary, but inevitable. Even today, Mosley's followers argue that war could have been avoided. John Christian runs an organisation called the Friends of Oswald Mosley, which publishes a newsletter, Comrade. Its message, Mosley was right. Our interests were in the empire, not in Europe at that stage. There was no interest of ours to go poking our nose into Europe. 
And it is, I think it's pretty well proved conclusively now that Hitler never wanted war, Germans never wanted war, they wanted to go east. And looking back over half a century, Bill Wood has no regrets about his involvement in fascism. I'm sorry I didn't do more in the way of activities to support them to prevent another war because that was Mosley's whole idea in the later period at any rate to save not only the empire but to save this country getting bashed up as well and as he said then it would have saved about 20 million lives if they could have got a negotiated peace. But the conflict Mosley was so anxious to avoid lasted for six terrible years. Fred Bailey, another of Mosley's supporters, suggests that Britain's declaration of war in September 1939 was not a sign of Mosley's failure, but of his political success. How could you say the man failed? In my opinion, the war was done to prevent Mosley from taking power, because it was on the cards for him to take power in this country. Such talk is wildly exaggerated. Mosley's fascists never achieved wide support. Even in their East London stronghold, they couldn't win a single seat on a local council. At the height of his popularity, Mosley probably had no more than 50,000 followers. But Geoffrey Hamm argues that Mosley's movement was not a Hitler fan club, as it has so often been portrayed. We opposed the war not because we were pro-German, but because we were pro-British and did not think it was in, in British interests. He said we should do nothing to injure Britain or assist an enemy. We should obey the law, and particularly if we were members of the forces, we had a number of members in the forces, we should obey the rules of the forces. But subject to that, and we should do everything within the law to try to persuade the government to make a, a just and honourable peace. Mosley himself was suspected, on slender evidence, of being prepared to cooperate with Hitler if ever England was invaded. In 1940, he and his wife and hundreds of his supporters were interned under emergency wartime powers. An injustice, says John Christian. By that time, most of Mosley's young men were already serving in the armed forces. And in fact, the first official casualty of the war, 20-year-old Kenneth Day, a number nine squadron RAF, was a Mosley black shirt. After the war, Mosley was a spent force. The fascist powers had been defeated, the economic depression was over. He recognised there was no future in fascism. There's no question of resurgence. At the last day of the war, my husband said fascism is dead. Mosley turned to advocacy of greater European Union, alongside strict racial segregation. But his movement made little impact. Mosley himself lived much of the time in France, awaiting the call to become Britain's saviour, a call that never came. Sir Oswald Mosley died in 1980. Not a disappointed man, insist his followers. It was Britain that had failed, not Mosley. Together in Britain, we have lit a flame that the ages shall not extinguish. Guard that sacred flame, my brother Blackshirts, until it illumines Britain and lights again the path of mankind.